Welcome to Silvercoin Age of Monster Hunters, a game where 1 to 5 players will travel the land of Atosia in order to fight and slay the monsters that are bothering the local populace. By doing so, they will gain the coins which they will need in order to win the game. The game will last for 2 years, divided into 8 seasons, 24 months, or in gaming terms, 24 rounds. After those, the player with the most coins will win the game, ties being decided by the player highest on the reputation track. Hey guys, welcome to the how to play video for Silvercoin Age of Monster Hunters, an updated version. We have prepared this video to hopefully guide you through the process of how to play this game and after we are finished with this video you should be able to play the game. For any additional rules you can always contact us via Discord, write us an email, but we will also shortly be finishing up our updated rulebook which we will upload on our website and we'll share a link to it in the description of this video. Without further ado, let's just jump right into it. Silver Coin Age of Monster Hunters can be played as a solo game, a cooperative game or a competitive game. In this video, however, we are going to cover this competitive mode and focus on a 3 player setup. And now let us get our feet wet and start the entire thing off with a setup of the game. To set up the game in the Tabletopia, there really isn't that much more to do, as most of the components are already set up for you. So together we'll just cover the parts you do have to set up and show you how. We will start off on the left side of the game board where there are monarch and townsfolk cards. For some of these we need to finish the setup and for others we have some tokens we can place to help us remember certain things as we play the game. First for the librarian townsfolk card. Depending on the number of players we set up the matching amount of kingdom tokens on its card. We are playing a 3 player game so we will place 3. Secondly for the plague doctor we will need to place a matching plague token on the kingdom where he is currently located. In our case, this will be a green kingdom of Lis Blanc. Third, we have the Unforgiving Monarch. He has his own band token that we will place somewhere on the map. Above the card, we can see that he is located in the red kingdom of Fabula, so we will place the token there. Moving on, we have the Clairvoyant King. He has his own little board above the tavern board. We just need to mark in which kingdom he is present. Next, we have the Monster Hunter's card, which tells us to place the max 1 token on the associated kingdom on the tavern board. This will indicate the maximum amount of missions that will come out in that kingdom. So again, this is in the Red Kingdom of Fabula and we mark it by placing the token on the second spot on the tavern board like this. There, we have two more to go. The Texar Monarch is in the Yellow Kingdom of Abaris. He comes with its own set of components, which are these roadblocks that will help us indicate that the player entering that kingdom has to pay for doing so. So we place this on the entry spots for the kingdom and if the kingdom has a port, don't forget to put one there as well. Abaris has one, so we place it. Lastly, there is a skeptic monarch. He has his own token with minus 10 picture on it. We will place it in the purple kingdom of Morahan on the world map. Next, we will go to the tavern board to set up our starting mission cards. We start again with a total of 9 mission cards. So first we will draw 6 missions from the mission deck. In case we get more than 3 missions for any of the kingdoms, we will draw replacements instead and discard the extra missions. Likewise, we will not be placing more than 1 mission on the spot for the Red Kingdom of Fabula as it has the Monster Hunter's Townsfall card and has a maximum of 1 mission that can be placed there in this game. The max 1 token we have placed there previously is there to remind us of just that. After we have finished placing 6 mission cards on the matching kingdoms, we will place 6 level 1 white monster tokens on them. Then we will draw the 7th mission card and place the level 2 brown monster token on it. And we will finish the tavern setup by placing the 8th and the 9th mission card together with the level 3 red monster tokens. Now we will move to the color dice area. There are 3 subsections for those. Depending on the number of players, we will draw that many dice for each section. In a 3 players game, the number is 4. And we will get them by randomly drawing from this purple bag. So 4 dice on each of these 3 areas. Above the dice area there are two reputation tracks. The bottom one is called the bonus reputation track. and the end of it, the first player to reach it will receive a special bonus token that he can use at any point of the game. We need to put one bonus token here at the start of the game by randomly drawing it from this golden bag. Above the main game board there is the herbs area. There we see 7 face up herb cards and the herbs deck. We need to just check and make sure there aren't more than 2 cards from the same kingdom. In our case, we can see there are 3 blue ones from the Kingdom of Voldemort. So we will return the rightmost card to the deck, shuffle it and draw a replacement until we meet the criteria. The last thing we need to do to set up the game is to go to the auction board on the left upper corner of the Tabletopia 
and place the equal amount of character cards to the number of players on the auction board itself. So we will do that and place 3 random character cards on the auction board. There, we are done with the setup for Silver Coin Age of Monster Hunters, and we can start explaining how to actually play this game. Auction phase. So let us start with an auction phase. Auction phase happens only once in a game, which is after setup is done. Here we are going to bid for our starting characters, location and magic, so three separate auctions. If we look at the auction board, we can see four different spots we can put our token on. Each gives us different amount of coins. The low spot gives you most starting coins, but can easily be outbid by other players. That means that after a player has bid, the next one can outbid him, by putting his token on the spot above. Let's look at the example. Firstly, we bid for our starting characters. Each character has a unique ability and also a special ability, which he can use when a special flow round takes place. For first auction, we randomly decide the order in which the players will start the auction. Blue player wants to go with a natural chaos character, but he also wants to start with the highest amount of coins, so he will put his token on the lowest spot below the natural chaos card. Yellow player wants a shapeshifter, but he doesn't want to be outbid easily, so he will put his token on the second lowest spot, granting him 70 coins. Finally, red player goes last. She also goes for the natural chaos character and can outbid the blue player. She puts her token one spot above the blue player, granting her 70 coins, thus outbidding the blue player, who now has to bid again. This time he can decide to outbid either of the two players, but will receive a maximum of 40 coins, or he can decide to go for the seeker and receive 100 coins. He decides for the latter. When all players have already bid, they take their starting characters and put them on their player boards. They also take their starting sum of coins for that auction. The second and third auction plays the same way as the first one, except for one smaller adjustment. The order in which those auctions will take place is now decided by the numbers written on top right side of their character cards. Lowest number goes first. For the second auction, players will be bidding for their starting location and kingdom knowledge. When finished, again take the sum of coins accordingly, place your character figure on your starting location and place kingdom knowledge token on one of the possible spots on your player board. The positioning of the token is important, because as the players will be gaining new knowledge tokens, they will be able to again place them on any remaining open spots on their player boards, and once a row or a column has been filled out, the player will immediately gain the associated bonus. For the third and final auction, players will bid for their starting magic and amount of flow, flow being one of the resources within the game. There are two types of flow, the magical and physical. After the auction, take the gain amount of coins, flow and matching magic card back to your player area as we are showing here. Now that we have done this, players should have on their player boards there, starting character card, one starting kingdom knowledge, some flow, magical or physical, one starting magic card, some starting amount of coins ranging between 0 and 300, and should have placed their player figure on their starting location, marked on their mission card. One final thing players need to do before they enter their first round is to mark their player order on the bottom right side of the game board. Same as before according to the numbers displayed on their character cards. Lowest number goes first, second lowest second and so forth. After the three auctions, the auction part of the game is completed and we move to the second and main part of the game, the game rounds. As already mentioned, there is a total of 24 game rounds, each representing one month on the calendar track which keeps track of the round, but also let us know what time of day and type of weather we are experiencing in a particular game round. The weather cards on the bottom of the calendar track will in addition indicate what type of a round we will be facing next. There are in total three types of game rounds. Normal round, bidding round and flow round. We will first explain how the normal rounds work and then return to see what happens in the bidding and flow rounds. Normal game round. A normal game round consists out of three phases, preparation phase, action phase, cleanup phase. Preparation phase. Preparation phase is the first phase every player does on their turn. Everything regarding preparation phase will involve kingdom cards, which are located below the game board. They represent players' activities as they travel the world of Atosia. If we take a look at one of the kingdom cards, we can notice three different things. First, its color. There are six colors, each representing one of the kingdoms. Secondly, in the bottom corner of each card, there is a number, ranging from 1 to 7. This number represents the card value during the bidding. Last thing to know regarding the kingdom cards are the symbols on them. There are four possible symbols each card can have. Experience, represented as a star symbol. Reputation, represented as a thumbs up symbol. Movement, 
represented with a winged boot symbol. Flow, represented with a flowing circle symbol. Some cards might have multiple symbols on them. Those represent multiple choices, but you can only pick one. You can only do one of the three things during preparation phase. Draft, play or replace cards. Let's look at them separately. First is drafting. You can only draft two cards for each preparation phase, unless certain ability tells you otherwise. You can either draft cards that are face up or from the deck, but make sure you don't exceed your hand limit at any given time. At the beginning, that limit is 3. This means that if your hand limit is 4 and you currently have 3 kingdom cards in your hand, you can only draw one card that round, so you do not draw the second card. Take note that drafted cards will only be replaced from the kingdom deck once a player has finished his or her preparation phase, meaning the player will receive two new face-up cards maximum. Replace cards. Your second option is to replace a card. You can only replace one card from your hand, but you also choose from both deck and face-up cards. Keep in mind that you do not discard the card you are replacing from your hand, but you instead put it on the spot of the card you just took. Third and last option is to play cards from your hand. You can play any number of cards from your hand, as long as you match one of the two criteria. First, all played cards are of the same color. Second, all cards are played for the same symbol or purpose. So let's say I have four cards in my hand. Three of them are red and the fourth one is blue. I can decide to play all three red cards regardless of their symbols. On the other hand, I could also play one blue card and two red cards if I play them for the same purpose or symbol. In this case, I would play all three of those cards for reputation. When we play cards, we add up the number of symbols and receive that many resources or move that many spots on the map. In the previous example, I would receive four reputation on the world reputation track. The last thing we need to take a look at for the preparation phase is what each symbol does when you play it. As mentioned before, reputation simply moves you up to reputation tracks. First, let us take a look at the main reputation track. What it does is, it gives you many rewards when passing certain spots and also giving you permanent coin bonuses when completing monster missions. Also, as mentioned in the beginning, in the unlikely event of a tie in the final scoring, the one highest on the reputation track would win. The bottom reputation track is called the bonus reputation track. Here players will all be competing for different bonuses at the end of it, as displayed by different bonus token tiles. Once any player will reach that bonus spot, the bonus token is collected to be used at any point in the game. All of the player tokens on that bonus track are reset to their starting position and a new bonus token is placed at the end of the track. Experience symbol gives you that many experience cubes, which are represented as blue cubes. Experience is a resource necessary to learn magic, buy color dice, reroll dice, etc. Flow is separated in two categories, magical and physical flow. Each is used for different purposes. Firstly, when playing Flow Kingdom cards, we would need to take a look at the characters we are playing. Each character has a flow track on the right side of the card, showing you which Kingdom card color gets you which flow. For example, Natural Chaos would receive Magical Flow when playing green, blue, red or black color Kingdom cards, and Physical Flow when playing yellow or purple cards. Magical Flow is mostly used to trigger abilities or magic, whereas Physical is used to sustain certain weather effects or enable you to do more actions. There is more to it, but that is the general gist of it. Lastly, movement lets you move that many spots on the board. Simply move as many spots as the total number of the flying boot symbols on the plate card. In our example, that would be 8. With that, we conclude our preparation phase and we move to the main phase of the game round, the action phase. After the preparation phase is finished, you will clean up all the face-up kingdom cards and replace them with new ones. Then, the play will move to the main phase of the game, the action phase. Each player will perform one action and then in the clockwise fashion, play will move to the next player according to the turn order, until all players have passed. On their player board, players have a set of three action tokens they can use on their turn in the action phase. Players will choose an action they wish to perform by placing an action token on the desired spot. The first two action tokens are free to use, but the last one has a red circle underneath indicating it requires you to spend one physical flow to use the third action. Actions players can perform can be separated into two categories. Uncontested player actions and contested global actions. First are the player actions. These are located on their player board and marked with different symbols on the action spots. Let us go through them one by one and explain what they do, while also explaining the mechanics of the game as we talk about them. First one we will mention is the 
Location action. When players reach certain locations on the game board, they can perform the location action. And to understand how that works, let us take a closer look at our main game board. At the center of it, there is a big world map players will travel through. It represents part of the west continent of Atosia and is separated into six different kingdoms, each represented with a different color. There are also many shield icons with names above them. Those represent different cities, towns within those kingdoms. Gold shields represent the capital cities. Each kingdom has one of those. Silver shields represent towns where different temples of magic are located. There are only four of those, each devoted to a different school of magic. Bronze shields represent the remaining towns and cities of the six kingdoms. Then there in the yellow kingdom of Avaris there is this strange looking symbol representing the location where players can learn the ancient knowledge. And finally the final location where players can perform the location action are the herb gathering spots, represented by the herb symbol. They represent locations where players can gather different herbs. So let us start with those first. Gather herbs location action. Above the main game board there are 7 face up herb cards. Those are representing current herbs growing throughout the world. They can be of 6 different colors, again each representing one of the kingdoms of Atosia and therefore also the locations where they are currently growing. You can see each of the 6 kingdoms has 2 herb locations that you can visit to gather them. So when players are located at one of those 2 spots they can perform the location action, gather herbs. Then players will go to the tableau of 7 face up herb cards and take one card matching the color of the kingdom they are currently at. Let us look at the example. Say we are in the purple kingdom of Morahan and we want to gather herbs. We will go to one of the two possible gather herb locations and then we will take one matching herb card. It will present us with two possible choices. On the upper side of the card there is an option to gather the herb card for a total of 3 physical flow or we can choose the benefits on the bottom side of the card and we gain 2 antidote poison potions and one flow of our choosing. You can only choose one of the two options and you do it immediately on the spot. Let us say the player has chosen 2 antidote potions and 1 flow. He immediately takes 2 antidote potion cards and 1 flow cube of his choosing and discards the herb card. Then he draws a replacement for it making sure among the 7 face up cards there are no more than 2 of the same color. If you happen to draw the third one you immediately discard it and draw a replacement. After that the player indicates he has exhausted the herb spot by placing an exhausted herb token on the current herb location. This indicates that here players can no longer take the herb card location as this spot is now exhausted. However, as soon as someone would wish to take this action at the other gather herb location within the same kingdom, the token would immediately be moved from the first gather herb spot to the second one, thus making sure at least one spot will always remain open for players to gather herbs. Learn magic location action. There are four locations where players can learn magic each represented with a silver shield icon and each belonging to a different school of magic. Fire, protection, spirit and air. Each will grant different abilities that you will be able to use throughout the game, mostly when fighting the monsters. To learn magic players will have to perform location action plus spend x amount of experience. The amount will depend on the number of already learned schools of magic. Learning a second magic will cost 2 experience cubes. Learning a third magic will cost 4 experience cubes and finally learning the last fourth magic will cost 6 experience cubes. Moving on we have capital location actions. The reason they are called like that is because you can only perform them at one of the 6 capitals of the 6 kingdoms marked with a gold shield icon. Things you can do when taking this action in the capital are as follows. Visit the market. Learn kingdom knowledge. Visit a special townsperson of that kingdom. Take one monster mission. So starting with visiting the market, to buy potions, horse or a ship trip. There are 5 different potions that you can buy. Knight and Strength potion will grant you strength during the battle. Speed potion will help you move further when traveling on land. Minor health potion will heal you and each antidote poison potion will remove one poison token from your character card. Buying a horse will give you a permanent boost to land movement and buying a ship trip will enable you to make a one way trip on the seas. Second thing you can do at a capital is to learn kingdom knowledge. At the beginning of the game we saw players gain its first kingdom knowledge. It represents all the knowledge of one kingdom about the monsters that are roaming the land. To learn the kingdom knowledge of a specific kingdom you need to meet three criteria. First you must not already possess kingdom knowledge of that kingdom. Second you need to perform the location action of the capital of that kingdom. And finally you need to play a kingdom card of that kingdom with an experience symbol on it. 
Once you do that, you will gain a Kingdom Knowledge token of that Kingdom. This will help you fight the monsters and also increase the maximum hand size for the Kingdom cards by one for each pair of Kingdom Knowledge tokens you possess. Third possible thing you can do at a capital is to visit its special townsperson. There are several townsfolk you can visit and they will all give you different options, from selling your monster trophies to writing poems about your deeds and grant you coins. Discover them for yourself. The last thing you can do in the capital of the Six Kingdoms is to take one monster mission. On the right side from the main board there is a tavern board, where at all times there are 9 monster missions currently available. But which kingdoms are currently looking for you to slay the monsters will vary. So you can only take one monster mission card from a kingdom that currently has one available. There are 3 types of monster missions ranging in difficulties and level. White, level 1 monsters. Brown, level 2 monsters. Red, level 3 monsters. To take a monster mission, a player chooses one mission card from the row matching the current kingdom he is in, and then also drawing one monster card matching the color of the token placed on the mission card, so white, brown or red. Monster missions are also placed separately in columns on the tavern board. The columns represent the amount of information that is currently known about a specific monster. So if a player draws a card from the first column, he can turn the monster card and look at the monster card he has to slay for free. But if a player takes one from the second or the third column, he will have to pay 20 or 30 coins for the reveal. He can however decide not to do it and goes into the battle blindly. After a player has taken their monster mission, which is just a word used to describe a mission and its matching monster card, he will take it to his player area. Then we will have to refill the tavern board with a new mission card, making sure we are not exceeding the limit of 3 mission cards per kingdom or in case of a monster hunter's townsfall card, maximum 1 mission per that specific kingdom. The kingdom cards will always come on the tavern board from the right side, thus pushing any cards on their way to the left like this. Then we will use a monster refill below, take the next monster token available on it and place it on the card we just added. Once the monster refill is empty, you will immediately refill it according to the rules displayed on the left. Depending on which year of the game we are currently in, that will vary. Also, be careful to immediately wipe off the monster refill and refill it according to the second year display as soon as we hit the second year on the calendar track. Take note that mission cards themselves will have a lot of information you can use on them. On the bottom you will be able to see if the location is near water source or a forest, those can often offer additional bonuses to the monsters themselves. On the top left side of it you will be able to see the total distance in movement points from the capital to the monster mission location helping you plan better. On the right upper side of the card you can also see the distance if taking a shortcut using the hidden pads. More on them later. Players can have a maximum of 2 monster missions plus 1 red monster mission at any point in the game, so maximum of 3 if the third one is a red one. They can never exceed that limit, but what they can do is decide to discard monster missions at any point during the game, however they will go down on the world reputation track the same amount of spaces as the current level of the monster they discarded, and same with the bonus reputation track. So that was a capital location action, which as we just saw, lets us do many things. But there is one more location action we can do, probably the most important one too. Fight monster location action. So finally we are here. We are about to show you how to fight the monsters in Silver Coin Age of Monster Hunters. Basic of how to fight are really simple. Battle in this game consists of three phases. Pre-battle phase, battle round, end of the battle resolution. But before we take a look at each one of them, let us first take a closer look at the monster card. On the upper left corner of each monster card are the rewards you get if you slay the monster. Coins, reputation, experience. On the bottom left corner of each monster card are its health and base strength. On the right upper corner is the required kingdom knowledge. The required kingdom knowledge does not mean your kingdom knowledge needs to be the same or higher to the number written there, but instead represents a bonus the monster may get to its base strength if you do not have sufficient amount of kingdom knowledge. The amount of bonus the monster receives is equal to the difference between your current kingdom knowledge and the required kingdom knowledge on the monster card. If your kingdom knowledge is equal or higher than the monsters, the monster receives no bonus to its strength. But neither do you. The next thing we can sometimes see on a monster card is the crossed bones and skull icon representing the monster is poisonous. That only means that the monster will be placing one poison token on your character card for every single damage it does. Remember, poison tokens can be removed by antidote poison potions. Their effect causes a player to lose one health at the beginning of each new game round if they have any on their character card. No matter the amount of poison tokens on your character card, the damage they deal will always be 1. 
and if you are left with only one health, the poison tokens will have no effect. A player cannot die in Silver Coin Age of Monster Hunters, cause dying is just not fun. Next icon we can see on the monster card is a legendary sword icon. This one will represent a possible bonus a monster hunter can receive if he owns a special action card legendary sword or has unlocked the ability on their player board. When measuring the strength of the monster before the fight, for simplicity's sake, we always just deduce the bonuses a monster hunter would receive from its total strength instead. So if a legendary sword would grant plus one strength to a monster hunter, we can also instead simply say that the monster has one less strength in total. Next icon that we can see is the spirit symbol. This symbol represents that the monster can only be fought with the possession of the spirit magic, or with the use of the enhanced location action, which we will mention later in the video. Finally, one last thing we can see on the monster card are the various special abilities of a monster and bonuses a monster or a monster hunter can receive. They are displayed under the monster's picture. These are different bonuses a monster can receive if it's located near the forest, in certain kingdoms, if fought during a certain time of the day, in certain weather, and so on. Now that we know all of this, we can move to the battle itself. More specifically, pre-battle phase. In a pre-battle phase, players will be preparing for the battle by triggering any special abilities on the cards and drinking potions for their effect. Then the battle will begin and the players will fight the monster in many battle rounds until they either decide to flee, have lost the fight, or have slain the monster. So the first thing that happens after each battle round is determining if the monster has been defeated, the player wants to flee, or the monster hunter has been defeated instead. If the player flees, the fight ends immediately. The player loses the reputation equal to the level of monster but keeps the monster card. Don't forget to lose the reputation on both reputation tracks. If the player loses the fight, the player loses the reputation equal to the level of a monster but also loses the monster mission card. If the player wins the fight, he collects the rewards written on the monster card always receiving its bonuses going from left to right. First the coins, then the reputation and finally the experience cubes. Then the player looks for any additional bonuses he may receive from the world reputation track or from the monarch of the kingdom where he has been fighting and finally he takes the monster card, adds it to the left side of its player board as a monster trophy and discards the mission card thus freeing up one spot for the future mission. If the battle has not been won or lost and player does not wish to flee we simply move on to the new battle round until one of the above mentioned results occur. So now, how does the battle round look? Before each battle round the player has to determine the monster's total strength which is simply a monster's base strength plus any required kingdom knowledge bonuses plus any monster bonuses minus any monster hunter bonuses minus any card effects and minus the effect of a legendary sword special action card. Each battle round the player will first trigger any card effects then he will at the same time roll color and white dice then again he can trigger effects of any card and finally a player compares the result of white dice plus any potential bonuses to the predetermined total strength of a monster. If the monster's total strength is lower, monster receives 1 damage. If the monster's total strength is equal, nothing happens. If the monster's total strength is higher, monster hunter receives 1 damage plus 1 poison token if the monster was poisonous. Let us take a look of an example of how the battle looks like. The player is about to fight a monster, a level 2 monster, the werewolf. The card is letting us know that the werewolf can only be fought during the full moon. Looking at the calendar board we can see that we are currently in the second year of the game, in the month of September, and the full moon is present. The mission card is telling us the monster is located in a purple kingdom of Morahan in the city of Bak, so the player has traveled there and has just taken the location action. The battle is about to take place. Let us look at the monster card first to determine the strength of the monster. On the bottom left part of the card we can see the monster's health value of 4 and its base strength of 9. Now if we look at the upper right part of the card we can see that the required kingdom knowledge is 4. The monster hunter has 2 but he is going to use his special action card to bridge the gap so the monster does not receive any bonus to its strength. Looking back at the card we can see a legendary sword symbol meaning we can use it to fight the werewolf. On the card itself it says it will give us plus one strength when fighting a monster with its symbol. But for simplicity's sake we will simply say the monster loses one strength. Meaning the werewolf is now down to a total strength of 8. The monster bonuses are showing that the monster gains plus one strength if in the kingdom of Olimor, Jorvik or Lise Blanc. However we are currently fighting in Morahan which has a different symbol. So the monster receives no bonus. And secondly the monster gains plus one strength if it's located near a forest. 
On the mission card we can see the tree symbol, indicating that Beck is indeed located near the forest and thus the werewolf just gained plus one strength. That puts it back at the total strength of 9. Now we move on to the Monster Hunter's bonuses. The Monster Hunter will gain plus 1 strength if he has learned Fire and Spirit Magic. He has only learned Fire so he gains no bonus. The second bonus says he will gain plus 1 strength if he has obtained a Kingdom Knowledge token of Voldemort. As he did, that gives him plus 1 strength, but for simplicity's sake we will once again simply say the monster loses 1 strength instead. So the werewolf is down to 8 strength again. Finally, the player will drink one strength potion to bring the monster strength further down to a final strength of 7. Take a note that a monster hunter, if damaged at the beginning of a fight, can receive negative effects to his strength, which you would account for in this step when assessing monster strength. The monster hunter, however, will not lose the strength if he gets damaged during the fight. The negative effect will take place only at the beginning of a battle. One final thing we have to be wary before the battle is that the werewolf has a special ability written on its card. The higher level monsters usually do. It says that if a player rolls 1s or 2s with their white combat dice, the monster will not receive any damage. He can still use dice to prevent any damage in case of a high enough roll, meaning 7 or higher since we have established that the werewolf will have a battle strength of 7. So let us start the battle. Before the battle round, the player can trigger any special card effects. He will decide to do so with his fire magic card, which tells him to allocate colored dice of one color to potentially trigger effects of its magic. Now let us roll all the dice and start our first battle round. So let's see how it goes. First battle round, uh, it's a 6. We are going to get damage unless we do something about it. We are going to use one experience cube to reroll the white battle dice. Only the white ones. Yeah, it wasn't enough. Uh, we are going to get damage by this. Moving to the second battle round. Ikes. Bad again, but we have plenty of experience cubes to use. Let's use it again. Much better. This time the werewolf gets damaged because 9 is more than 7. Next battle round. 4. We are going to use it again. Hopefully this time also a hit. No. We get damaged again. Moving on to the next battle round. That's great. So what happens now is like we have 12, which is obviously more than 7. So another damage to the werewolf. Then we are going to use the green um, dice that now is a 6 uh, to activate the fire magic. Uh, and actually um, we should spend 2 uh, magical flow to activate it. However, because the natural chaos ability says that uh, we can only spend uh, not only we can we can just spend one to activate it we are going to do that and we are going to activate it and deal another damage to the werewolf now we're going to do a great combo and basically use our legendary sword durandal which says that if the monster is at last held we can basically just spend two experience cubes and the speed potion which we do have in our hand uh, to deal the fatal final blow so yeah the monster is slain so with that we have slain the monster and now we do the cleanup we return the four health tokens from the werewolf back to the back we put the werewolf monster card on the left side of our character where the trophies are held and uh, we return the special action card study the creature uh, or rather discard it uh, and we also do the same with all the physical flow cubes and experience cubes that we have used during the battle and uh, we return the green battle dice, the color dice, um, to our dice area. And uh, we also can start getting the rewards, right? So basically what we do is we get 290 coins for slaying the werewolf, as it's set on the card. However, because the, the monarch in this kingdom is Didymus the Skeptic, he actually gives us minus 10 coins for slaying this monster. But then, on the reputation track, if you look, we also get a bonus plus 10 coins because we are up the reputation track. So that means that basically nothing happens. 290 coins, we get the, the entire amount. And uh, next to that, we can see that after you have basically gained the coins, you go and check the reputation how much reputation you get you get four reputation for slaying the werewolf and that means that basically we move uh, up the track 
both of them actually so the reputation track the main track um, meant that we get the bonus on the on the on the big world reputation track uh, which is basically we can do anything we want with one kingdom card we can draw it from the face up cards or from the from the up of the deck we can play it from our hand we can do whatever so we decide to draw and uh, then basically uh, we also go for up on the bonus reputation track and uh, with that we have done everything that we can for the reputation track but we also do one uh, we get uh, also experience so we get two experience for slaying the werewolf and with that we have finished our fight learn ancient knowledge location action final location action we can perform is located in the yellow kingdom of abaris on the world map it is the way for us to get the seventh knowledge token that will increase our understanding of the monsters and will help us prepare for battles better to gain it we have to first move to the location on the world map second use a location action and finally discard the necessary amount of kingdom cards with this ancient knowledge symbol on the bottom left of the world map there is a special area dedicated to just that we can see that the first player to do it will have to discard one such card second player two and third player three of them that means in a four or five player game there is a chance one or two players will not be able to learn it as they learn it players will put the token of their color on the first empty spot on the ancient knowledge track so these were all the possible location actions now remember one really important thing if it so happens that you're in a location where you can perform multiple location actions, you take them all of them in the same turn by only spending one action. So if for example a player is located at the capital city and one of the monster missions he is yet to take also happens to be at the very same location, he can, with one location action, visit the market to buy potions, tavern to collect that monster mission and fight the monster he just received as a monster mission all on the same turn. It is rare, but it does happen and makes such missions that much better. Let us now move to the next possible action players can perform on their player boards. Movement action. This is the main way the players will be moving on the world map. There are a total of three ways of moving in this game. First, land movement, second, sea movement, and third, teleportation. All of them can be performed by placing a token on the movement action spot. Let us look at them one by one. Land movement. On the world map, players will be moving by following the black lines which are connecting different locations and flags. Black lines are supposed to represent roads. Shield icons, gather herb icons and the flags are supposed to represent stopping points and each of them represents one point of movement. The base movement a player will have is 5 and it can be affected by different bonuses or maluses. To increase their base movement, players can buy a horse or drink a speed potion, while the negative effect on movement will be for example caused by the current weather. To understand how weather in this game works, we have to take a look at the calendar board. On calendar board we find different information. The year we are currently at, the round, season, month we are currently at, the time of day cycle we are currently experiencing, daylight, night time or full moon, and at the bottom of the calendar track there will be so called weather cards. There are four types of weather cards, one for each season, spring, summer, autumn and winter, and each of those cards is separated into three different parts one devoted to each month of the specific season which remember is also representing one round of the game upper part of that section on the card will be showing you the weather we will be experiencing in that month round of the game and its effects the possible weathers we can experience are as follows clear weather that has no effect on your movement rain snow and rainstorm where your movement is affected by minus one or minus two on movement Drought, no effect on movement, but if moving, you need to spend either one physical flow or suffer one loss of health. And finally, Snowstorm, which puts minus 3 on your movement and also requires you to spend one physical flow when moving or you lose one health. Below each of those weather icons and effects, we can see a circle where we will be moving our weather token on, to keep the track of the current weather we are going to experience in this round. Below that, there is another circle, and it will be either empty or containing a symbol within the circle. That is important and will tell us the current type of the round. Remember, we mentioned before there are three types of rounds. Normal, bidding and flow round. But more on that later. On each weather card around one of the circles we can also see two arrows. Those are there just to indicate when the players can flip the next weather card and look at the future weather and things that await them in the following season.
So when moving, a player will just count the base movement total of 5 and add or subtract any bonuses to that because of cards or weather effects. Let us take a look at a short example. A player is moving on land during the winter in the month of February. It is currently a snowstorm and he has a horse and no speed potion. His base movement is 5. His horse adds 2 to his base movement. The snowstorm will take away 3 for a total of 4 movement and he will pay 1 physical flow when moving so he does not suffer any health loss. Special note about moving on land. You may have noticed we can also see some white lines and dots on some parts of the map. Those are representing so-called hidden paths. There are three of those. Path through the desert, path through the mountains, path through the marshes. Players can travel through those only if they have obtained special action cards which allow them to do so and they can use them as shortcuts to reach destinations faster. Next is sea movement. In order for a player to move on the sea, he needs to meet Greek conditions. He needs to perform a movement action, he needs to have a ship journey card that he has obtained either through a market in the capital city or through reputation track bonuses, and lastly he needs to be located at one of the four capitals containing ports within the game. Those are capital city of Gobekli Tepe in a purple kingdom of Morahan, capital city of Lemuria in a yellow kingdom of Abaris, capital city of Lilac in a green kingdom of Lisblanc, and a capital city of Oldefar in a blue kingdom of Oldemur. When moving on a sea, a player will be able to reach the next nearby port with just one movement action. He will also disregard any current weather effects taking place. If a player, however, wishes to continue the sea journey further to the north or south, it will be necessary to stop on the so-called anchor points, and next turn the journey can be continued either by stopping at the next port, or in a rare case of moving from far south to far north again stopping at the anchor point. Whatever the case may be, we can immediately see that sea movement allows us to travel big distances in a short amount of time and also disregard any weather effects taking place. Even faster than traveling via sea is moving via teleportation. To do that, players need to obtain a teleportation scroll card or through receiving a gold teleportation token on the reputation track. It can be used as one of the three possible movements and will grant players an ability to immediately teleport to any of the six capitals. Now that we have looked at all of the location actions and types of movement you can use with your movement action, it is time we speak about the next possible action you can perform, the combo action. A combo action is in a way a combination of two different actions, movement plus location action. Well, almost. However, to use it and to perform it, a player needs to play a kingdom card with a movement symbol matching the kingdom where his player figure is currently located at. He can then in any order move and take the location action, but his movement is limited with the number of movement points written on the movement kingdom card. So technically speaking, it is not a regular movement. This movement is not affected by any positive or negative effects, meaning players cannot boost it and weather cannot affect it. So we can immediately see that the benefit of this action is that it allows us to move and perform a location action by using just one action token. But we do have to spend one movement kingdom card to do it. Still, it is a powerful action which can allow for players to optimize their journey. Fourth action on our player boards is the Transform Flow action. This one is simple and it will allow the player to transform one type of flow for another. It is not a powerful action but can be useful as a way out of certain situations. And last is the Replace Kingdom Cards action. As the name suggests, a player can replace one of his Kingdom Cards from his hand with one other Kingdom Card face up in the Kingdom Cards area. We can immediately notice that this action is colored red. That indicates a player needs to spend one physical flow in order to use it and if you use your third action token to take it, that would actually result in you having to spend two physical flow cubes. One for the third action token and one for the replace kingdom cards action. With that, we conclude the uncontested actions players can perform on their player board and now we will move to the final group, the global actions. This can be found on the lower right part of the main game board. These action places are contested, meaning any player can take the action. Once someone places an action token there, no one else can go on the same spot. Let us take a look at them. First is the exchange flow for experience action. A player can exchange any two flow cubes, magical or physical, for one experience cube and vice versa. Second is the gain experience action. A player gains one experience cube. Third is the random draw action. When taking this action, a player draws one card from the top of the Kingdom Cards deck and adds it to his hand. A player can perform this action only if he still has space for additional Kingdom Cards, keeping the max amount in mind. 
Fourth is the turn order action. The action spot is colored in red, meaning you need to pay one additional physical flow to execute. When performing this action, you immediately move your player marker on the first spot of the initiative track, and at the same time moving the other player markers one spot down. Next is the Enhance Location action. First we can see it requires one magical flow to perform, as indicated by the purple color of the action spot. It enables you to perform a location action just like normally, however at the same time it also allows you to do two things. First, battle spirit monsters, even if you do not possess the otherwise needed spirit magic. And second, if visiting the tavern in the capital and taking level 1 monster mission, it enables you to take two level 1 monster cards, reveal both and choose one of the two possible monster cards for your mission, discarding the other. Thus, not only you are able to pick your monster mission, you also do not have to pay for revealing the monster mission, even if the mission card was located in a second or a third column in the tavern. It is a very useful action, and can also enable you to take more than one location action on your turn if needed. The last global action is the Buy Color Dice action. We mentioned color dice when doing the setup and showing you an example of a combat. Well, this is the action that will allow you to go and buy these color dice. In the color dice area, there are three subsections. Each time you take this action, you can buy the dice from only one of those. Each has its own cost, indicated with the experience symbols above. Quickly looking through them, it goes like this. In the first color dice section, a player buys one color die, leftmost on the track, for a total of one experience cube. In the second color dice section, a player can buy any one color die if he wishes, for a total of two experience cubes. In the third color dice section, a player can buy any two color dice he wishes for a total of three experience cubes. Color dice are used for combat and usually require a card to activate. In addition, as a bonus, this action will also move you one spot up the initiative track and move another player's marker one spot down. With this, we have now gone through all of the possible actions the players can take. And once again remember, players each take one action in a turn order until all have passed, ensuring downtime is shorter and the game more fluid. After all the players have passed, game round enters in its final cleanup phase. Here we only have to first move the turn token for one spot to the next month on the calendar track, second if need be and we enter the second year move the year token as well, and third and lastly move the weather token one spot on the weather card or to the next weather card. And thus we can begin a new game round. Before we jump into the final scoring there is one more thing we need to mention and go through. We already mentioned there are three types of rounds we can have. A normal round, a bidding round and a flow round. We already covered a normal round, now let us cover the remaining two. Remember on the bottom front part of the weather cards within the circle there can be two symbols. The bidding symbol and the flow symbol. Those are used to indicate that in that month or game round we are entering the bidding or the flow round. Let us look at them separately. First the bidding round. When the weather token is placed on the bidding symbol on the weather card, that means we are entering the so-called bidding round. Everything happens the same as in the normal round, with two exceptions. First, players are only allowed to perform one action this round. This means that even though you have three action tokens on your player board, you can only use your first one, so plan carefully. And second, before the preparation phase, players will be using their kingdom cards to bid for the special action cards available face-up in the upper right side of the game board. Yes indeed, we finally are going to cover those as well. There are in total the same amount of special action cards available for players to gain during the bidding round as there is the total number of players. So in a 3 player game that number would be 3. So players can already know in advance what they will be bidding for and plan accordingly. We also already mentioned that on the bottom right side of the kingdom cards there are numbers from 1 to 7 indicating the value of those cards during the bidding. Players will in turn order decide to pay one or more cards face down to indicate with which kingdom cards they are bidding. After that they will simultaneously reveal their cards and add up the values of the kingdom cards. The player with the highest total value will be able to pick a special action card first, second highest bidder will go second and so on. In a case of a tie the turn order will be a tiebreaker. Players can also decide to not place any kingdom cards and thus not participating in the bid but they will not receive any special action cards as a result. Their characters will gain no new abilities. Special action cards are a powerful tool with which players will be progressing and upgrading their character. Each game there will be a total of 4 to 7 bidding rounds, so plan carefully. The last type of a game round is the flow round. When the weather token on the weather card is placed on a flow symbol, we are entering the flow round. 
It is called like this because theme-wise it is supposed to represent the increased amount of flow present in the world of Atosia when it happens. Each of the characters will have its own special ability it can perform only during such a round and it can be performed at any time during their turn in that round. For example, a natural chaos character is, during the flow round, able to place powerful portals only he can use and travel through. The number of flow rounds per game will also vary, so plan wisely. So with that we can now go into the final phase of the game. End game scoring. After the last round of the game, which will happen on the last month in year 2 on the calendar track, we will not be going to the cleanup phase but instead continue directly into the end game scoring. Players will count up the total amount of coins they have and the player with the most coins will be declared the winner of the game. In the event of a tie, the player highest on the reputation track will win. Remember, coins in this game are a secret information, till the end game scoring takes place. There, we have made it to the end of this video. You should now be able to play the game and if you have any questions you can always contact us on Facebook, via email or through our official Discord channel. Links will be provided below this video. Thank you to everyone helping us playtest this game and coming along on this amazing journey. Till next time hunters and may your bags be full of silver coins.